Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Fear to Peer. My name is Kyle Spencer. I am the executive director of the Uganda Internet Exchange Point, but also the co-moderator for this session. The uh, Sorry, hang on one second. Our objective today is to understand the impact of the pandemic on peering practices. For example, our industry for a long time has been based on face-to-face -face networking and handshakes, and that's not really the same now with COVID. So we really want to explore that. And as part of that, what's changed over the last year and a half in terms of peering practices and talk a little bit about what the impact has been on IXPs and their businesses around the world, and also touch on some of the impacts on the human network. Important, we need to thank our sponsors. The interpretation today is brought to you by Flex Optics, and we're very grateful. They've uh, been sponsoring a lot of the translation at our events, and, and, and we love it. This event is also brought to you by NAP Africa, PAX, Facebook, and Microsoft. This is not the first time these organizations have been involved in our events, and we are extremely grateful. And at this point, I think it's appropriate to hand over to Amrish Fokir, who is the main moderator, so that he can properly introduce the session, our panelists, and get things started. Amazing, Kaya. Thank you very much. So welcome, everybody. This is VPS number 11 from AFPIF. We would like to welcome you, uh, and I hope you will have a great session today. So before I start, I would like to thank our simultaneous interpretation services series sponsor, which is Flex, Flex Optics. And uh, we would also like to thank our series sponsor, NAP Africa, Facebook, PIX, and Microsoft. And also, we are also very grateful to the Af uh, program committee who worked tirelessly to put that panel up and running and the AFIX secretariat and the support team helping us with the live stream today and the closed captions. So COVID-19, as the pandemic has turned this world upside down, with the, within the internet industry, physical networking events and peering forums had to be canceled, unfortunately. Otherwise, it would have been such an, such uh, so nice to actually meet you in person and debate as we are going to do today. So all types of events have been reimagined into digital formats or hybrid formats. And also this pandemic has had it's all actually on the network interconnection system, especially on operations and on the human network. So today in this session, we are going to, to explore what have been the impact of COVID-19 on the organization of peering forums around the world. And we would like to understand how activities such as peering bilaterals and social, which are usually heavily in-person dependent, have evolved and have moved to social as uh, a sorry to virtual or to, to hybrid versions. And we, we are seeing more and more how events are pivoting to more virtual events like we are doing today. We would like to know we would like to know what, what's going to happen next. And also what are the innovating ways peering forums are currently exploring to keep their community engaged amidst this crisis because it must be quite challenging to keep people engaged People are facing Zoom fatigue and all sorts of things. For this today, we have an extraordinary panel of speakers, starting with Esther Pal. He's coming from Nick CZ. She's the accounts and communications manager. Welcome, Esther. Then we have Nico Shintu, who is the operations manager from IPDRC, and he's actually in charge of the RDC IX, so the group of IXPs in DLC. Then we have Rebecca Klaus Peter, who is the events and operations coordinator at EuroIX. Welcome, Rebecca. Last but not least, we have Yolandi Robinson, uh, who is the peering and interconnect specialist at NAP Africa. Welcome, every everybody. So before we start, I would like to run a quick poll. I would kindly ask the support team to launch the poll right now. Thank you. I'll give you a minute or so, and then I can end the poll. And here are the results. So during this time of uncertainty, which event format would you prefer the most? So people have voted for hybrid events. So we are both looking for online and in-person events. So today we will talk about what's the different possibilities and how are events pivoting actually. Thank you. 
All right. So let me first ask our speakers to introduce themselves uh, briefly, and then we can get going with the questions. Starting with uh, Yolandi, who is first on my screen. Okay. So hi, everyone. Yolandi Robinson, the peering specialist at NAP Africa. I'm responsible for the business development of NAP Africa, as well as the daily operations with the IXP. What else would you like to know, Amrish? Maybe a, a, a fun fact about you? I don't know. Am I a fun person? I don't know. Fun fact, we, I we will... <laughs> feel fun. I'm a sticker collector. There we go. I think the community knows that. Oh, right, exactly. The next person on my list is Esther. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for having me here today. It's a great honor. I'm Esther, and I'm with the Neutral Internet Exchange in Prague. My title is Account and Communication Manager, but since we are a small entity of nine people, it is also the business development part and also event organizing bit that's my task, and also the day-to-day -day liaising with our members and customers. I've been with the exchange for nearly nine years now and it's been a great experience so hello everyone who are members and partners of Nix. thank you esther i think you're a known face in the community welcome next on my list is nico shindu thank you amrish and thank you to all the community and i can see many of our friends my name is nico shin and i'm from the democratic republic of congo and i'm director of administration and for the uh, Intercept P Service Provider Association. And I'm also responsible for the internet exchange in Kinshasa. I am in Kumbra at the moment where we have recently launched a, a, a third exchange point. And so that's what I've been working on. Thank you. Merci, Nico. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. So you are actually building the Volcano Internet Exchange. That's great. <laughs> So finally, we have Rebecca. Please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. And I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you all for joining. I'm Rebecca, and I am the Events and Operations Coordinator for URIX, which is a membership association for IXPs. And we're actually one quarter, I'd say, of the, including LACX and also AFIX. And also we have APIX for Asia. So my role involves the day-to-day -day operations of the association, supporting the work of the managing director, which is Bishal Sankani, and um, most of you know her, I'm sure, and also, obviously, the events. Great, Rebecca. Thank you. All right, so we can get started. So we, we, we have three, I would say, sessions of questions, each treating different subjects. So we would like to start with the first one. Can you tell us briefly... How were things before the COVID and how are things now and what changed in your different community in, in the way you organize events? And perhaps you can also tell us now how, how the different, how your, your operations have also changed uh, in this time of a pandemic. Let's start with you, Yolandi. Before the pandemic, I think we were a very sociable group. We had a whole bunch of events here in South Africa that we hosted one that is very popular here is beers for peers so it was great engaging with the community and getting to know everyone and also traveling to the various events where we get to see other peers our international peers as well as potential clients operation wise we used to be in the office um, every day you know interacting with the other teams in in Terraco. And what has changed since the pandemic is that obviously everything has gone online, which makes it a bit of a struggle to engage still with the community. One way we do this is by hosting Terika Tech Days, which is a virtual event that we try and do once a month to try and keep that engagement with the community. Operations-wise, we have implemented different strategies in terms of our patching at the data center and how we will manage that. Obviously, everything can be done remotely. So it wasn't really a big change. I think the biggest factor is just not having that interaction with your team immediately, where you now need to go onto a Skype or WhatsApp call or Teams, uh, Microsoft Teams to be able to reach your teams. But I think people have adapted over the year. And it's become the norm, I would say. I think it would be weird if we started meeting in person again. 
how would I greet you? Would I do the elbow thing? I think we've also, like your facial expressions, you go into a monotone because the cameras also, you do the, hi, everybody. But in person, you need to be lively and interact again. So I think it's it's going to be strange going back to it. It's I think it's been a good change, the virtual thing, because I've been able to, to attend events that we in the past would not travel to. So for instance, the Lennox, the, what else? There was ITW. There, there's a few of them that I personally would not have traveled to, but I had the opportunity to get to the content online and also meet the people in the social chats or uh, social thing that they have going on the side. So that is how it changed for me. Great, Yolandi. Thanks. So, Esther, for you, has your community or your organization actually pivoted to COVID-friendly events? Or, or how, how do they look like? First of all, I would like to comment on what Yolandi said, which is uh, very similar to what we experienced here. Also, it was a very sudden change for us since March, let's say, when before we would attend many events all over the world and suddenly we were stranded in in Prague. And it was so the first three weeks were absolutely blissful because I think you all had it like you wouldn't change from people. I admit I hadn't changed. I had day pyjamas and night pyjamas, but that would be the, the, the beginning. And it was really nice to just settle down and quiet down a bit. But then after some time, it, it has become very strange. So it, this feeling of being stranded and being basically isolated in not just in, in physical terms, but also socially, it was very difficult. And uh, it, it was a big change. And what we did, so normally our exchange would have three to four in-person meetings for our members and uh, customers every year. And naturally at the beginning, so we, as you um, may have heard about our peering days, which is the annual international conference that we organize in cooperation with the Vienna Internet Exchange and Budapest Internet Exchange, was basically cancelled one week before we were to start the event itself. It was something difficult to deal with. And then later in the year, we were thinking how to keep the community involved. I think many people just got off the radar completely before actually these uh, platforms were available or we found out how to use them. So later in the year, we managed to organize a couple of online meetings which were a huge change in comparison with what we would have normally. Also, we struggled. The first one wasn't, it wasn't up to what we normally would have it in person, but then it evolved. So it was much better and we had great feedback after the second one. We are very lucky to say that recently the restrictions have eased up here. And in June, we were able to do a hybrid meeting with our members. And that was beautiful. So you could see, even though people were still a bit as in concerned about meeting in person, but normally we would have a, like the presentations and the technical updates, and then we would have a, a small social. So people would come for the presentations and the, and the technical part of the, the event, but they wouldn't stay for the social. So that, that was a big difference from what we would normally have. But it had a great feedback and you could see on the people that they are hungry for being there in person and trying to be in touch again. What we did also, we introduced a couple of uh, mailing lists and uh, like mail groups where people, where our members and customers can discuss um, issues like policies and technical stuff that on top of what we had in place before, that would be probably it in a not share what we managed to do in the past year and a half. Okay, interesting. So we will talk about the hybrid events uh, more, a little more in the next set of questions. And for you, Rebecca, EuroIX is like the central organization for exchanges. So we all like to go to EuroIX events. So what, how, what has worked and what hasn't worked? So prior to the pandemic, we were holding two, four per year in, in conjunction with our members. And these were held at different European cities. 
each time first in the first quarter of the year and the last quarter of the year. Um, so obviously that could not be done. So we changed that to an online format to begin with. And I think at first we had a few difficulties in trying to match up what we did physically to and translate that into an online um, format. However, I think the FPC doing a great job of picking out the relevant topics that interest the membership and the wider community and um, still holding those events online. So uh, we try to now do about three or four fora online and we're still having the same amount of people attending, so from 100 to 150. But what we have done is open that up to the whole community. So it's not just our members um, and invited guests which was a difference um, in the physical. We also split up the interest of the membership and made different stream of online events. So we have a panel in conjunction with, we have a Learn With Us, which is online tutorials and workshops. We have what we started off as COVID talks, and these started off as welfare checks in a, in a sense to see how our membership is doing and this kind of translated into business continuity so how are the membership doing but going beyond that and looking at how they can sustain their ixps beyond um, covid how they can do their budgeting and etc so these have been relatively um, successful and in fact our members have given us some feedback that they would like some of these to carry on beyond Um, the pandemic. So even if we return to face physical meetings, they want these to carry on. So we are doing a number of things and I think that they are going to carry on um, beyond physical meetings. That's great, Rebecca. So it's amazing how how creative the human can be when in in the face of a a pandemic. And we actually come up with very good ideas that now people are actually would like to see in the long run. And that's great, actually. So we can launch another poll. So we would like to know, for example, we would like to know what are the concerns uh, that people have if ever we would like to go in back to the in-person event. So we, we all know that we are in the phase of recovery. Hopefully soon we, we can all uh, travel again. So what would reduce your concerns about in-person events? Is it travel logistics? Is it mandatory vaccination requirements? Or is it on-site protection measures? Good. We can end the poll now. Oh, these are very close, actually. So the people voted most for vaccination requirements and to a lesser extent travel logistics, for example, quarantine and PCR tests and on-site COVID measures is coming last. Great. I will now hand over to Kyle for the next set of questions. Kyle, over to you. Hey, thanks a lot. So I just want to carry on a little bit of the discussion we were having before. So what I learned from the last round of conversation was that hybrid events are are starting to happen in some cases. And so the question is, do we think this is going to continue? And if so, is that going to introduce new challenges from an organizational point of view? And for example, if you have to manage physical events once again, but also you have demand for people from people to continue these virtual events, what are the challenges that you might foresee associated with that? Is this gonna put a strain on your organization? Let me throw that first to Rebecca. Actually, actually, let me throw it to Esther because you're the one who mentioned that you're starting to have hybrid events already. I think maybe you'd have some insight into this. Sure, I think people who know me, they would know that I am a great advocate for in-person meetings. Hybrid meetings are okay. Virtual meetings are, for me personally, not okay. I think the main point of us being here is building a community. And in in terms of having a hybrid event, because we can't do it in person or because we are protecting our members and customers and friends from COVID or other horrific illnesses, then it's okay. But I think nothing is going to replace an in-person event. I see the benefits in terms of having people who could not normally attend. We have members all over the Czech Republic or outside the the country and not all of them can attend because it is just logistically not uh, possible. So with the hybrid events we introduced recently, 
they can also participate. And it's lovely. From this perspective, this would be something that we would probably want to keep on, maybe not for all of the meetings, but for some. But if it was up to me and the situation allowed it, I would probably want people to be there in person because community building is about the proximity and being together and being able to to talk to each other, see each other. This event is wonderful, but I can't see who's listening to me. I can't see people's reactions. I can't relate to people who are on the other side of my screen. And this is something that you will never be able to replace by a virtual event or a hybrid event. Because anyone sitting behind the screen somewhere remotely is might get the information they are interested in, but I don't know if it actually is being part of the community, if you are feeling involved the same way as if you were sitting in the same room, drinking your beer next to someone, etc. So I don't know if this replied your answered your question, but this is my view. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the insight. I think that's valuable. But Rebecca, now I want to toss it over to you because I think you were also mentioning that you've had a lot of success with the virtual events and I imagine that those will continue as well. Do you guys have the capacity to maintain the virtual event streams along with the physical events when you return to them? Do you foresee challenges there? I, th- I think that the, there is a challenge of, of the human nature or the human capacity, I would say, but I don't see it quite in the same way as Esther. While I do agree that, yes, some of our more remote members or audience in the community can join us virtually, I also think there are some people who actually prefer some virtual events as it doesn't uh, place as much demand on them as the in-person events. We've had conversations with people who were wanting to create more, I'd say, quieter spaces or safe spaces. Some of the that they found quite big and in person. So carrying on um, a hybrid, um, I think, would not only benefit those who are remote, but those who also actually do not want to attend such big events in person. Another thing is that some people actually just like hybrid events as well. So we do have to consider that we perhaps cannot keep the same format as we we would like and adapt accordingly, really, for the future. But I guess what my question is, as Euro IX, can you, can, are you going to have to increase like your staffing, for example, to manage this additional sort of event? Is there an additional workload associated with holding hybrid events from your side, from an organizational perspective? Of course, yes. We have actually been talking with Bright PNTC, who are also thinking about this going forward. And we would be working with them to do the hybrid events. So that conversation has already been had. And in terms of translating the streams of online events that we do have, I wouldn't say that that there's more demand. Myself and Bijal, we organise these events, we manage them, and they're usually 30, 40 minutes of workshops or tutorials. So it it wouldn't place as much demand as organising, for example, a physical workshop. Okay, all right. That's good to note. And is that we, I, I want to touch a little bit on what the poll results look like because they're asking people about, uh, there, were, there was an expression that travel logistics are a big concern for people returning back to events. So as an events organizing team or somebody hosting events, it, it seems to me that in the future, these might pose additional burdens on the event organizers. I can only imagine if we were to host another AFPIF, we'd have to have confirmation from the host government about their procedures related to the COVID testing requirements and, and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. So I'm, um, I'm wondering if you foresee some of the same challenges, what you foresee, and maybe uh, Yolandi, you want to jump on that from the South African perspective? Yeah, so to touch on what Rebecca and Esther has said is that we all want to get back out there and go to these in-person events because that's our nature. However, my personal concern is, are we ready for this? To go back into these big groups and just talk and relive what we we did pre-pandemic. I mean, myself, I would love to get out there. I'm a very sociable person. I've been described as an external or extroverted person, (laughs) but I've been experiencing social anxiety. So for me, just going to the shop and having about 10 people around me out of nowhere, I would get a uh, panic attack, which it just developed over the past year. So I think the hybrid solution would be good because it also allows us, especially from 
South Africa's point of view, we can't join all the events. But with a hybrid solution, we would be able to actually see the content and, and get some insights in what's going on in the community. I think it would also give you more participation because then in your company, you can have two teams or you can rotate your, your people depending on how they feel about attending uh, in-person events. So you can have someone in the team that focuses on online events to get that knowledge and then share it with the team. And you can have someone that actually goes out there and join these in-person events for the social networking and all of that. I also think we need some easing into it. So I think it's a bit much to expect that people need to get onto a plane and join, let's say, the URIX in Europe. It's not just the physical event that's a problem. It's the in between, what happens in between. So me having to go to the airport, having to deal with confined space in, in the plane with a lot of people around me. There's a lot of factors. So I think we need to ease into it, maybe start with small local events with our peers locally, and then gradually making it bigger and having an open discussion. Are you ready for this? Now that you've done a small event, are you ready to do this? And in terms of the, the logistics, I think, as you all know, Africa is a little bit behind with the vaccine. So for us, it's still going to be a while before we can actually join you guys at physical in-person events. So for us, a hybrid solution would be preferential because at the moment it's still an ongoing process. I do, however, think it, it's a bigger discussion to have around what do we do at events? How do we greet it, each other? Not everyone is going to be happy shaking hands all of a sudden. You're still going to have that hesitation and it's going to be that awkward moment of how do I greet someone? What do we do in terms of name tags? You don't want someone to touch your name tag and then give it to you. And it's still all these pandemic things that's going to go through your head. So there's, I think there's a lot that's going to change, especially in the first few events, in-person events that we do. Some things do need to change and need to be discussed. Like, how do we approach it? What does the community feel we can do at events to, to make them feel comfortable and safe to attend? That's, that's really good insight. I particularly like the comment about how organizations involved in peering events might benefit from having a physical person and a virtual person because of maybe their different comfortable how comfortable they are attending each one. I think that's, yeah. And I do think the first in-person events will be a little bit awkward. Maybe we can help people along by providing some suggested protocols for social interaction at them. Nico, uh, do you have anything to add on this topic? Yes, I wanted to add something because we are in a society where we are building the peering in ecosystem. So when we are trying to combine in person and online, this presents us with a lot of problems. Those who are already ready in the ecosystem who are already there, then it's fine to move over to online. But for newcomers, it's much more difficult. That's why we are trying to combine both. And we we have made sure that the international in online is is made available locally and person but within small communities so we need uh, there are some re requirements so but for us what i meant to my mean to say is it's not particularly uh, difficult because we are building our community and we have with newcomers because this is what helps to build the community we need some in person activities thank you nico so Kyle is facing some network connectivity issues. I'll just take over from here. Nico, that, that, these are very good points. Thank you. Actually, we will explore this a little bit further in your presentation in the next, next session. But before that, I would like to have another poll. 
on on your views on virtual network applications and services. Some of them you might know already. For example, we are going to use Gather Gather Town. So we would like to know how do you like to use those tools and what's your experience with them. Okay, so we see almost a tie break between people like using virtual networking apps and people that have not yet actually found one. So I guess there are still a lot of lot of improvement to do in that space and and to make actually the the experience of virtual events as seamless as possible and actually to keep i think the challenge the, the biggest challenge is actually to keep people engaged and, and to for them to actually have a better experience online sometimes people can get lost with all of these tools that we have people also suffering from zoom fatigue and and, and so on so great. And then we can now move to the next session in which I would like to invite our friend Nico to present his experience on how he navigated through, through the pandemic to actually set up a new IXP in, in Goma, a, in, a, in also a challenged place because of the volcano and people that had to, to move out of the area. But still, you managed to, uh, to, to build a community and to build an operational uh, internet exchange. So, Nico, over to you. Please tell us this very nice story. I'm going to try to talk about the experience that we had. So to begin with, I would like to just say how the effects of the pandemic in the RDC, we uh, suffered a very high mortality rate um, and according to we had about a thousand deaths according to the official figures and f other countries may think that's not very many but it was a lot for us and afterwards w there was a positive aspect to to this covid meant that the internet was used much more than it had been before there was more working from home lessons online so people who were not normally within a, a community on the internet have used it more than, than ever. And so that's been a positive thing. As I said to the uh, delegates, we're talking, uh, what I was talking about is that we're trying, we're at, in the process of building an online digital community of consumers and uh, users of the internet. And that's been very noticeable in terms of the exchange point before covid we maybe had 13, 14 gigabytes, but now, after COVID, that's risen to 80%, perhaps at 25 uh, gigabytes. And this growth has happened because there have been more use of social media, like WhatsApp or Skype or Zoom. We have had to conduct our relationships over distance using these social uh, media tools like WhatsApp. People have done banking transfers online. There are lots of things. The pandemic has actually brought something positive to our community uh, in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. So now I'm going to talk to you about the building of the exchange point when the pandemic started. It was difficult to decide what to do, but we thought we, we should just go ahead with the construction in Goma, which is the third after Kinshasa and therefore the method of working had to change. There was lots of building to do and it was difficult because people were um, not allowed to travel and it was difficult to use tools. But we used tools like WhatsApp and Zoom to connect with people in Kinshasa, with us in Kinshasa, with the people on the ground in Goma. And so we ran the operation from Kinshasa as soon as a, a stage had been completed, we, there were photographs sent to each other. So we, we were able to use all the tools of the internet to complete something. And now it's a reality. The exchange point in Goma is now there. Uh, and that's as a result of the use of the internet and applications. And as I said, WhatsApp and others. And as you can see in the photographs, the, we had to have technicians uh, on the ground in the exchange point. But this experience showed us there were obviously disadvantages. Uh, we, we couldn't 
completely do things just as we wanted to. I was in Goma, in Goma, for example. I've been there for two months, but it wasn't quite done as uh, I'd hoped. But that's the disadvantage of working at a distance. But 90% of it was. So the objective of staying in Kinshasa to construct an exchange point at, at a distance, but we saved an awful lot on the budget for travel. We didn't need to go to stay in a hotel. So we saved money because we did it remotely. Uh, we even bought material from a shop, but remotely. We would actually purchase equipment remotely. During the COVID period, we've actually seen some advantages and we saved on the budget that had been planned for the exchange point. Now at the moment, I'm in the on the premises at the exchange point in Goma and we're going to launch this exchange point next month there are some things we still need to do and in particular training and so in, in terms of training we'll do exactly as we did before we'll combine virtual and in-person training and we're going to work with technicians on the ground they will receive their training on the ground on the exchange point and then officially we're going to launch the exchange point on the 17th of September and we're going to invite our partners to celebrate this opening. Of course, we did face other difficulties. We had to stop uh, and assess the, because the town was evacuated and therefore work stopped. But then we've started again and there's no concerns in terms of the Goma and it's working and work, life had begun again at, in Goma and I called on our partners to come and help us in Goma and to provide their experience for the launch of the IXP. And I'm going to share a little video with you just to show you what happened in Goma because it will show you that there have been there were areas that were destroyed and because Goma became a, a, a tourist town and I'd like to show you just what happened. And there you can see the uh, volcano and within the craters uh, wh where you can see the lava this that that has dried the lava where it poured onto the town has dried and we have to wait perhaps 20 years to, to for this situation to repeat itself uh, at other tourists you can come and visit the volcano where it erupted what we would like to invite you to come and live this experience and see what happened and we can show you this even remotely thanks to the internet technology i would like to thank you thank you thank, thank you nico i think we will, we will wait that it cools down completely before we come <laughs> because otherwise we, we might get a hot spot over there <laughs> that's great a nice a nice story about how you built a i can assure you I'm rich. Uh, my, I saw it myself. I went and uh, it's amazing, as well as uh, visiting the IXP, of course. It's a great attraction. Great. Uh, in invitation received. Thank you, Nico. I was telling how amazing this story is, how actually you managed to build a brand new IX amidst two crises, actually. So uh, kudos to that. Maybe a question still to you, Nico. During the pandemic, have you seen any change in, in, in membership or traffic, uh, let's say in clinics in, in Kinshasa? Yes, following the pandemic, there were big changes in Kinshasa. There's been an increase in exchanges. We are trying to to build a community. But nowadays, the meetings are online, are virtual, even government meetings are online, everything. So COVID has really changed life completely in uh, uh, the DRC. In a way, we say thank you to the pandemic, to COVID, because it allowed us to act as a catalyst to show the community that you can use the internet very effectively. Great. Thank you, Nico. How about others? Yolande in North Africa, have you seen a change in membership, either an increase or decrease, you know, in, in the growth of your membership base? 
And also for your operational practices, has there been any actually any change? So we've seen a good increase since the pandemic. From March 2020, we actually seen a 100% increase in traffic. In March 2020, we reached the one terabit mark, which we celebrated at home. (laughs) And then now we are peaking at two terabits of traffic. So within a span of a year, we were able to double that traffic. In terms of members, there has definitely been a good increase of members, especially from the African countries. We've seen a good interest from the African countries wanting to connect here in South Africa. And then in terms of operations, because we are obviously trying to uh, adhere to the COVID restrictions, we've seen obviously an increase of remote hands and interconnection within the Terraco facilities because the the clients are unable to travel if they are from a different country. And also locally, we've had some restrictions on our provinces, which prevented our members to be able to reach the Terraco facilities if they are not in the province where the facilities are. So we've seen a good increase of remote hands having to assist the clients with patching or installation of hardware. And then, of course, as I mentioned, interconnection. We've had a whole bunch of new interconnections with people realizing how important online is and how important the cloud is. A lot of companies here in South Africa, they are still doing a local server or pen and paper. But during this pandemic, I think a lot of companies reassess how they do things. So most enterprises we see are actually connecting to the internet exchange point, wanting to peer themselves, as well as adopting a cloud strategy to enable their workers to work from home. So it has definitely changed, and I don't think it's going to slow down anytime soon. I think with this whole pandemic uh, Companies have realized and networks have realized how important it is. Another factor which obviously helped us on with the traffic increases here in South Africa, and I think generally in Africa, users at home do not have accessibility to high fiber at home or something like that because they're so used to going to the office and there's internet. So you download all your Netflix and everything at work and you come down. I'm kidding. We don't do that. But now with the change of working from home, a lot of people had to, you know, contact an ISP to be able to get fiber or connectivity, internet connectivity at home. Because you have your children that are now studying or doing school online. You are yourself, you're working from home. So you rely on the internet because I need to do this meeting on Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever it may be. So it has definitely changed. And I think going forward, companies are perhaps going to do a hybrid model of working from home and the office. And that is why I say I don't foresee traffic going down or membership slowing down. Interesting insights, Yolandi. Indeed, we we actually saw how how traffic increased in many internet exchange points over the world and and actually in some of them being in Africa. But we also saw a lot of traffic decrease in in some IXPs in Africa because, as you said, most of the traffic perhaps were coming from businesses. And when people move from businesses to home, they didn't have the same connectivity. They were maybe on, on mobile data and then they couldn't actually afford to have the same experience as, as they were having an, in the office. How about you, Esther? Because maybe the scene in Europe is completely different from the one in Africa. Has you has Nixis uh, Nix been yeah. forced to actually modify their operational practices? Actually, yeah. not the operational practices as such. Not naturally, we didn't come to the office. So something mm-hmm. that in the past would have been unimaginable totally. So even the labor code is changing now because of the pandemic. Before it was absolutely mandatory that we would be in the office. It has changed totally, completely. I could probably even say that we had groups of technicians that would be working together and they wouldn't swap. So that would be team team A, team B almost. So that was definitely kept strictly safe so that in case of one of one of the technicians would have been would have had COVID, then then the other 
team wouldn't have been affected. We also noticed an increase, uh, a serious increase, I would say even 30%. What we did with the first lockdown, when everyone stayed at home suddenly, we encouraged our members and customers to increase their connectivity and connections into uh, Next, and we even offered for a certain period of time a backup port free of charge. So that was something that we did. I agree with Yolandi. I don't think, I can't really mention that the, the traffic is going to go down. I think it is going to stay like this. Many companies here in the Czech Republic are already saying that they are not letting their employees go back full time. Even big international corporations are saying that they are giving up some of their office buildings and it will be either short weeks and long weeks that the employees would be coming in on certain days of the week. And also they don't want the categories mixing. I think it is in this respect, it is uh, similar to what was happening over there. Naturally, the, the connectivity situation in Central Europe is different than it is in Africa. So there were companies who were compensating their employees for staying at home using much more power and electricity and internet and stuff like that. So you hear these success stories and employees saying they have a wonderful employer. So I think even with the horrible situation we found ourselves in, there are like these heartwarming outcomes. So not everything is bad that happened. It's lucky that uh, these people are lucky to have uh, so considerable em employees to actually pay for their bills. I would like to have one that that fill my fridge, for example. My fridge is always empty when I'm at home. <laughs> Great. Uh, maybe a, a final wrap-up question, maybe to you, Rebecca. So in light of all of that we have discussed, what do you think now to, to, to actually you know, do that pivot towards virtual or, or hybrid events? In what organization should invest to actually make sure people have the best experience, make sure the community remains engaged over the long term and people don't crave to go only for in-person event, even if we all crave to, to have a beer uh, in, in, in a beer for peer session. But yeah, Rebecca, tell us what, would, what advice would you give to, let's say, the higher management? I think with any event, it's just setting clear goals and objectives for that event, knowing how you will measure that success it's very important, if not more, than deciding which platform you're going to go with for hybrid or what you're going to do for socials in person. It's of equal importance or equal weighting. So I think the old methods of just putting on the slides and stuff and presenting may also still not work. We, we may have to do a little bit extra, but we also did talk about how we're going to do these things logistically. So we have to give that consideration. Do we need more manpower? Do we need more platforms for the people who are watching remotely? How involved are they going to be? Is it just going to be streamed or would they have a voice? So all this depends on what level of engagement we're expecting for the physical and the remote or hybrid kind of platforms. So I think all in all, I would say it takes a lot of thinking, a lot of planning. But it can be done with teams, with PC members. For us, it'll be the forum program committee. We'll, we have to have those conversations with the teams and with the managers. And I think one thing to remember, though, is the point of all this is to be an engaging community and inclusive community, too. So we have to think about how we're going to, to do that um, together. Thank you, Rebecca. Esther, would you like to add to, to what Rebecca just said? No, I totally agree with Rebecca. And, and how about you, Yolandi? Uh, what advice would you actually give to the organization to keep the, the, the vibe going? My advice would be to have an open discussion with your employees. I know it's not something that we used to do in, in the past. It was not something that we used to do. But I think it's very important to have an open discussion around, are you ready to go back into the world? So how stable or how strong is your mental health at the moment? And I'd like to use the analogy around a, by saying, think of yourself as a copper cable. A copper cable has four pairs. As we know, once you connect it, over time, that pairs, the pairs inside the four pairs gets loose. So the data is still transmitting, but at a lower speed. 
So it's not to say that, you know, the cable is broken. It can be fixed. You just need to find what was wrong. And it takes time. It does take time. So my advice would be for employees as well as employers to actually sit down and have this open discussion, no judgment, no thinking less of the person, just having an open discussion to say, are you ready for this? Because we all need to be ready for this. You can plan events as much as you want, but if the community is not ready, they will not attend. Very important, Yolanda, indeed, to make sure employees and employers are on the same line of thought uh, so that they achieve the, the same goal, especially in these challenging times. Nico, would you like to add on in the future, how do you th see things happening? Is it, for example, the experience with Goma IX, would you like to repeat that with another internet exchange in, in the RC? Yes, it's been a good experience. And there are others that I've not shared with you. I also fell ill and I worked from home at, during that time. And then when I recovered, and then I started to ask myself, is it important to go to the office every day? And you see, that's the kind of questions that we ask ourselves in these cases. And there are some companies where employees work in the office and others where the, the employees work at home. And it does work. And perhaps there's be a team within the, the uh, DRC that some working at home, some working in a central location. And now we have to think about what's the best approach to combine working remotely with working together. And I think that we actually work more when you're working at home because you work all the time. So it's, it's important to analyze at the moment what the best way is. And that's how I see things. That, that's uh, actually also an interesting insight. Now, we, we do work more than, than often. The good thing, we spend less time in, in commuting, but still we spend more time online and, and, and on Zoom calls like these ones. So it, this brings us to the Q&A sessions. And I see in the Q&A that we have two questions. The first one is, do you have any special protocols during these events to limit transmission? So this is in relation to in-person event or those who have organized hybrid events. So maybe Esther, could you give us a quick- Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So health and safety is absolutely important for us. With the in-person meeting or the hybrid e event that we had, it was everyone who was coming would have to have a negative test with them. Also, we would keep the distances mandatory, um, face mask wearing. Also, our event was held in a space, in a venue where it only had a roof or only had basically three out of four walls. So we had fresh air in and uh, people could keep the distance. There was an offer of refreshments, but also distances had to be kept and everyone had to wear a glove in when they wanted to, to take something. In terms of future events, uh, so we are very optimistic about 2022. I hope no one is going to get offended here, but people, if you can get vaccinated, because this is the only way out. I understand not everyone can get the vaccine for some reason or it's not available, but if it is, please don't just postpone it maybe later because this is the way out of this whole crisis. As I say, we are very optimistic about 2022, the peering days. What we are trying to do is push them further into the year. So not do it early spring, but maybe late spring and do it in a venue where the, the peering days has a morning program usually, which is a panel and, and lectures. And then the afternoons are bilateral meetings. So for 2022, we are going to look for a venue, find a venue where all these bilateral meetings can be done outside. Social events can be outside. And also it would be mandatory to have either proof of vaccination or daily antigen or antigen or rapid test on the venue or at the venue. So these things, no handshake policy, temperature measuring on arrival to the venue, etc. So you can manage an event safely. You have to plan for it, prepare for it, but it can be done. So this is how much I can add. Thank you, Esther. 
So perhaps we can move to the next question. Do the panelists think that an easy return to in-person meeting is viable? Also, would a return be more viable than online events? Rebecca, would you like to take that one? Just thinking about what Esther just said, which I fully agree with. No, it's not going to be an easy return. We have more <laughs> logistical considerations to, you know, think about. And we also have the safety of our participants to think of. Easy return? No. Viable? Yes. So long as we follow the stipulations of the country, of the venue, and just make sure everyone's safe. I think we can do that. Yeah. And we have a last question. Are in-person events more value valuable than online events? What do you think, Yolandi? I think they are. But they can be. The content, the slides, is easy to get online. We can record the session for you. But I do think that we all want to travel to meet people. We want to socialize. We want to build relationships. And as Esther mentioned in the beginning of the session, it's difficult to do that over Zoom or Skype or whatever because, uh, again, uh, most of the time my camera is off. You, uh, you can't see me. You, you don't really get to know me. You get to know my laptop. So I think in-person events are good, especially in the community, to start discussions and all of that because I feel on Zoom it's a bit awkward and you have this thing of talking over each other and all of that. But still, online is something we need to consider for a more inclusive community. Thank you. Thank you, Yolandi. How about you, Nico? Do you think in-person events are more valuable, basically? And for example, did you have better advantages traveling to events and meeting people in person than actually you, the type of work that you have been doing online? The, the, there's nothing, nothing can replace in-person events. And to get to know people just by being in, in close proximity with people, I've shared something with somebody else. It's true. You people like Amrish, I haven't seen you for a long time and I miss that. It's, it's it, it creates a, a, a social dynamic. Yes, virtual in, events are important, but it's not natural. Indeed, Nico. As you said, we are all a big family and, and hopefully soon we will be able to, to meet again. But in the meantime, I think virtual and, and hybrid will be the new norm. And as we have uh, spoken here today, we are trying different ways and different techniques to make sure this new experience is actually a, a good one. Yeah. So this brings me to the end of the exchanges. And if Kyle is online, I will ask him to do a quick wrap up. Cool. Yeah, I am here. Just to recap some of the key takeaways. COVID was a big initial shock. Everybody in the group mentioned that there were event cancellations. Some of them were even last minute. And though it might have been good to relax at first because of a hectic schedule that was going on prior to COVID, isolation eventually set in and became a problem. And today we've got a lot of work from home, which has pros and cons. On the bright side, we all get to wear pajamas all day, but we also have less interaction with our colleagues and the loss of in-person events has made it difficult to maintain community engagement. But there were some successes. Esther mentioned that Nix.cz had some success offering additional mailing lists and other channels through which the community could communicate on specific themes. Rebecca mentioned that you're on similar attendance now at their virtual events as they did in the physical, and even introduced some different online streams that cater to specific content areas. It was mentioned that virtual events are more accessible and have enabled some of the people to attend that might have not attend events that they might not have done so before, European Peering Forum, Global Peering Forum, whatever. And so there's demand for them to continue regardless of any potential return to in-person events. But there is concern that the new paradigm has become the norm and, uh, and people might feel really uneasy or awkward about returning to in-person events. And, and so that'll be uh, an interesting challenge. Travel logistics are also a big concern when working towards that, especially vaccination requirements. Event safety was also is also a concern, but uh, there were a number of there are a number of ways to manage this, and uh, our panelists shared some tips from their experience. It was also proposed that organizations should consider assigning different people for physical and virtual uh, events, depending on personal readiness and preferences. And it was also mentioned that we also noticed in the poll that a lot of people uh, like virtual networking apps or at least appreciate the concept, but there were a significant number of people that haven't really found one that they like yet. So it sounds like there's a lot of room for improvement in that area and a bit more experimentation as we go forward. 
We talked a bit about the impact on IXPs, and at least at Nix.cz and at NAP Africa, and I think also at the DRC IXPs, traffic increases have been observed. And the anticipation in the markets where that's been seen is that the traffic levels will not decrease over time as we hopefully fade away from the sort of lockdowns and other sort of severe impacts of the pandemic. And finally, the Goma IX will have its launch event next month. So that's exciting and stay tuned for that. And that's about all I've got on the summary. If you guys want to see the video again, please feel free to rewatch. I'd like to thank all of our panelists, everybody who's attended, and particularly our sponsors. As I mentioned earlier, Flex Optics has helped with the translation. We're really grateful to them for that. And we've also got support from NAP Africa, PAX, Facebook, and, and Microsoft. So we are very, we are very grateful. Also, thanks, of course, to the program committee who helped put all this together. There's a big team that goes on behind these events, and there's a lot of work that goes into them sometimes, and we're very grateful to the whole team. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Michuki, who hopefully has some peering personals for us. Michuki, are you there? Yes, Kyle, thanks. We do have a few slides that came in for peering personals. Let me just bring up the slides. One second. So, Emra. Thank you, Machiki. Hi, Machiki, and hi, everyone. Thank you. To, thanks to the panelists for the nice discussion, especially nowadays. So, as AMP6, we are based in Amsterdam. Our biggest platform is here. We have POPs in Amsterdam, 14, and later this year, we will launch two NIF in the southern part of the Netherlands, Smart TC and Greenhouse data centers. We have almost 900 connected networks at the moment to us, only to our internet exchange in Amsterdam. We have a peak traffic of more than 10 terabit per second. So we have other internet exchanges around, around the world as well, in Hong Kong, India, Caribbean, in the US, and in Bahrain. Again, later this year, there will be two new internet exchanges, one in Uzbekistan and another one in Egypt. Both will be powered by AMP6. And you can see our team on the photos, myself, Noha, and Ono. Please let us know if you, if you have any questions or inquiries to AMP6. Thank you. So next up is IXPN, Charles Sikusan. All right, good day. Sikusan from Internet Estate. As we can see, we're from ISPN. We, our ISN is 36932. We have already upgraded the members that we are up to 85 now and our peak traffic in the year 2021 is 240 gigabit per seconds. We have our uh, locations in Nigeria, but most of them we have in Lagos. We have in Medallion, Rack Center, MDS, we have ICN and we are about to establish another one in, at the cloud estate. We are also in Abuja, we are in Ugo. What I'm trying to do is just to make sure that everybody in Nigeria, they have the content localized. And our peering pol policy, we are open to any multilateral peering or bilateral peering, anyone. If you want to contact us, our address is there beside our listing, email us, then our website. We are very ready to have you at the, our, in our estate point. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Hello, can you? Okay, uh, my name is uh, Lebo Hokekan. I'm representing Urban Infraco, which is a state owned entity in South Africa. We use AS uh, 327698. We do have presence in uh, three provinces uh, where NEP Africa is actually present as well. We do connect to the established ISPs in South Africa, some of them tier one, some of them tier two. We've got presence in, uh, which is in Johannesburg, and uh, we do have presence in uh, Teraco, uh, Devon, uh, which is based in the in the KwaZulu Natal, uh, which is another province in South Africa, and then we do have presence in uh, Teraco, Rondebosch, which is in Cape Town, which is uh, another province, uh, Western Cape, in, in South Africa. We offer services to a small. Uh, and medium uh, ISPs uh, in South Africa. We give them a platform to actually be able to compete with the, the bigger ISPs uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, we are state-owned, as I've already indicated. And then one of our uh, the biggest customer is actually the national government itself. Uh, so all the 
the national uh, entities um, are actually using our infrastructure to actually run their day-to-day IT services. So we do pre with the cloud providers as well, for instance, the likes of uh, AWS and, and Azure uh, in South Africa. I think that's uh, broadband infraquays in the nutshell. Thank you, Lebo. And uh, that brings us to an end of hearing personals for today. Thank you for to those networks that applied. And uh, hopefully, if you like to have this opportunity, we will invite you for the next one at the next virtual pairing series that will be taking place in November this year. And so please look out for the announcements that will be coming. We are certainly quite happy uh, to think through around the opportunities that we have ahead of us. Most importantly, so the virtual pairing series, so there will be one in November. There will be another one coming up early next year in February. So please look out for those announcements. And as we close and uh, thank everyone, I'd like also to take the opportunity to thank the live stream attendees who've been following on v- Vmail live stream and Facebook. Thank you for joining us remotely. And also to our panelists, the moderators, thank you for making this event uh, really interesting. We've all gained something. And also to uh, the whole team behind the scenes, once again, thank you for all the work that you put in. To our translators, um, interpreters, the like live captioning team, thank you very much again for an excellent job. Thank you very much and see you next time.